first of all, uh, it's a great honor for me to, to come and lecture here for uh, the spring course. And um, indeed, as Stefan uh, was saying, uh, I've been um, working hand in hand uh, with Isrik for a, a very long time. In fact, when I finished my studies way back in 1974, uh, I came to Isrik before I was going to Africa to uh, find out what they had in their library to look at the soils of Africa because I was going to be posted in uh, Tanzania at that time and uh, I was actually received very well by late uh, Professor Van Baren who was one of the first people actually uh, in Isrik um, and uh, that, that <coughs> really struck my eye what, what you could find in Isrik I mean you're really in good hands here in this course because you're really at the heart of soil science of the world. So and ever since I've been coming back to Isrik, uh, after 10 years of Africa, I landed back in Belgium in the early 90s, and uh, I immediately uh, came back with students here in Isrik, and then collaborated indeed with uh, late Otto Spargaren, and then also now with Stefan Mantel on soil monoliths of soil classification and uh, land use issues. So my background is in fact since the early 80s I've been uh, almost on a permanent base involved, uh, been involved in projects in various areas, mainly in East Africa with a special spot for Ethiopia as you may see from my slides, but also, also in uh, West Africa, more from Nigeria uh, with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture based in Ibadan in Nigeria and then from there towards Cameroon, West Africa, Togo, Senegal, Benin. That are, that's a little bit my uh, kind of uh, territory, but I've been traveling in uh, many other parts in Africa as well on excursions. So I am very glad to share with you some uh, transects. When I was coming here this morning by train, I realized that after all, you are saying very little about Africa. Oh yes, of course, but I have only three hours. I mean, how do you want me to say, to discuss the soils geography of a continent which is about 3 billion hectares large? I mean, this is just an enormous challenge. So the only thing I can do with you, I hope you will uh, bear with me, is uh, to uh, look at the overall setting of Africa in terms of general geomorphology, lithology, the climate, <coughs> vegetation, and then after having set a scene like that, I will uh, take some broad transects from the Sahara all the way to uh, the uh, Gulf of Guinea, for instance, or starting in Cairo and then go up the mountains to uh, Ethiopia. So I'll take some large regions and then discuss with you the rationale why we find certain, certain types of soils and um, <clears throat> how we classify them then. I will not go into great detail for that. And then we will look at issues of sustainability because that's of course why we are doing soil science to provide advice to farmers but also to leaders of regions and to policy makers. And if we can translate our knowledge into world reference base we have a very powerful tool to, uh, to uh, bring to the surface issues of sustainability. So uh, <clears throat> that's why I titled <coughs> my presentation Understanding the Soilscapes of Africa with Applications for Sustainable Management. Management and soil classification, soilscapes, they all go hand in hand together and I'm sure we are sharing that kind of mission in life. So this is Africa. It's a kind of a broad digital terrain model and from that digital terrain model you can see that Africa is in fact an enormous kind of uh, sockle, I call it in geological terms, it's part of uh, Gondwana land which has been at the surface um, in uh, above sea level for the last two billion years. So geologically speaking it is very old and relatively little active if we compare that to uh, areas of uh, certain areas like the Alps in Europe. We had unbelievable turmoil in geological terms uh, 
But in Africa, the only thing that really happened is uh, a little bit of an uplift in the eastern part and then in the western side. Yeah, also a little bit of an uplift, but much less. And that leads to a, a continent which is going from something like 4,000, 5,000 in some cases, Kilimanjaro, almost 6,000 meters, but that's a volcano. General level here, about 1,000 to 2,000 meters down to 200 meters here in, in West Africa. And for the rest, flattened surfaces, uh, apart from in the east, where you have, of course, a little bit of volcanic, uh, um, which shapes the land. From that picture, you can also see that you have very big depressions. The Congo is one of them, the Sud here in Sudan. But also here you have very big depressions, uh, each of which have a special kind when it comes to uh, uh, understanding the soils. I will show you some of these um, differences you can uh, 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 come across. So uh, here, once more, the overall view of Africa, and you can see the river systems, Congo River, the Nile River, Sambesi, Orange River, and some Volta and uh, uh, Niger River. You can see Africa is relatively dry from these river systems. You have the Kalahari here, and the Sahara, big drylands. In fact, two-thirds of Africa is really, and uh, with that, I'm ready to discuss a bit more systematically, but uh, very broadly, the climatic uh, zones of Africa. This is, in fact, based on the uh, FAO uh, agroecological zones uh, uh, study, which is, in fact, uh, looking at the climates in terms of available water for the plants to grow. Of course, they speak of the length of growing period, which is the, those uh, um, days where the rainfall um, is, in fact, exceeding uh, the potential evapotranspiration. Uh, so uh, you can, in fact, look at the center of Africa where you have almost always raining. There is always enough moisture for plants to grow. But if you then go south or north, gradually you uh, get drier. So the length of growing period goes from 6 to 220 days up to 270, 365 in the green. And when the rainfall gets less than 90 days or 75 days for finger millet, no more possibility for growing crops. So that's uh, the rainfall as assessment for Africa. This is extremely useful for understanding soils, of course. If you're really in this uh, wet spot here, of course, you get on an old surface the most extremely leached soils, the most strongly weathered soils. You are going to have a kind of a clay mineralogy which is dominated by kaolin. If you go more into the drier areas, uh, soils are much less developed, are perhaps younger. Although also in the desert we may find some soils which are very old, but which are dating back to earlier wetter climates. For instance, 12,000 years ago, it was raining all over the place here as well. So you may also find some old soils there. Then. We also have the climate is not only rainfall, evapotranspiration, it's also temperature. And what is very typical for Africa is that it is really saddled across the equator. Here is the equator. So that means that most of Africa is actually belonging to the tropical belt. The tropics means all those areas with average temperatures of more than 18 degrees Celsius of all months per year for the FAO definition. There are some different kinds of definitions. And uh, look, this red line gives you the southern border of the tropics. And the red line here gives you the northern part of the tropics. So Africa, basically speaking, is a tropical, the most tropical continent of the world. And then you are, of course, having the subtropics and subtropics to the north as well. Then there is still another thing re regarding the rainfall I forgot to tell. Rainfall can either fall during the normal growing season, eh, when, when, uh, when it's warm enough for the plants to grow. In the tropics, that's always the case usually. But in the subtropics, think of the Mediterranean. There the rain is falling during the coldest part of the year. So that, of course, puts a bit of a limitation on crop growth. That's fine. If you have winter wheat, for instance, you can plant it over the winter and let it grow in the spring. 
That's exactly what people do in Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. And in South Africa, they do the same. So you do have some winter rainfall areas. So that's what I wanted to say about the climate. Huh? Let's remember that. From the climate, we can plunge into the potential vegetation systems. So here, of course, in the center, in the wet areas, you have the tropical evergreen forest. Then around that, you have a big belt of the savannas. Huh? Closer to the center, you have the tree savannas. If you go further away, in the drier areas, you have the kind of uh, uh, more grass savannas with the occasional tree somewhere in the valleys. And if you go further to the deserts, you will have the steppe kind of vegetation. And uh, then you have really the deserts. And then, of course, you have also in the north and in the southern part here, the Mediterranean climates, which are related to the winter rainfall and the summer drought, of course, and the heatness, the hot uh, during the, the, the unbelievable heat during the summer. So now we have laid the foundation for understanding the soilscapes based on the climate, but of course lithology, what is uh, the, the, the type of stones, rocks, weathering products, that's very, very important as well. So that's why I want to uh, discuss a bit the structural regions with only two, two uh, kind of slides. This is the general geology. Uh, whatever is blue in this uh, map is part and parcel of that old Gondwana surface with very old rocks. Most of it they call that basement complex. And in Africa, you, you're, you're on the right side if you say granite or gneiss. Gneiss is kind of a metamorph form of granite, which is a little bit folded. Yeah? And, and it's mainly quartz uh, rich material leading to relatively poor soils, I can say. You have, you have already learned this morning about acrisols. Acrisols typically develop from where granite is at the surface, either in a moist, very moist, or in a subhumid kind of climate. Whatever is in the brown colors or yellowish colors, that's transported material. That is material which has been blown from somewhere else or by rivers or whatever and then put down. For instance, in the desert, you have a lot of wind blown sands. You have uh, old colluvial areas. Here, this is all wind blown Kalahari sands, for instance, which start from Kalahari and go all the way back here, down here into the, the, the basin of Congo. So depending then on the climate in these sands, you will see that you will have, of course, entirely different soils here compared to there, but we'll discuss that later. Then a very important thing for mankind, I would say, is the presence of volcanics in Africa. And that, of course, relates to the East African Rift Valley. Uh, I'll show you in the next slide. But all the red parts here are what we call igneous, that is kind of... Uh, materials which have been uh, caused by volcanoes. And that's, of course, a literally an enrichment, islands of fertility in a very old continent. So in terms of chemistry, uh, you have a, that mostly in the East African system, but you also have here in West Africa a little bit of a rift system. And even in the, in the far West Africa, in Dakar, Senegal, you have some volcanics. So wherever you have these volcanics, that's for soils and for plants and for whatever is living on it is always uh, a good token, I would say, a promising sign. So this is more systematically. All these igneous areas are linked to rift valley systems. So here you have the Great African Rift Valley. Yeah, you know that. You have the West African counterpart of that, which goes from Mount Cameroon to the Tibetsi Mountains in uh, Chad, for instance. and. Uh, uh, in southern Algeria, the Hogar kind of mountains. And then in here, you have also a small little belt here uh, on the coast of Senegal. A very small one, a little rift uh, valley in Ties, for instance, in central Senegal. So now we are ready for the soilscapes. We have discussed the climate. We have discussed the overall geomorphology. We have discussed very briefly the, the lithology. I'll come back to certain concepts later on. But that's... Um, 
enough for us now to start exploring a little bit and applying world reference base on the Afri in African context. And I'm starting with the soilscapes of the Congo Basin. Congo Basin, permanently humid climate, what are you going expect to be, uh, to expect for the, for the natural vegetation? Of course, it is the tropical rainforest. We are in this part of the world. You see a very big red patch, feral soils, arenosols, nitisols here. What is the vegetation? The tropical rainforest, of course, in its natural condition. And luckily, there is still a large patch of that one in Congo, in Congo uh, Brazzaville. There is also uh, in Cameroon, southern part of Cameroon, are still large parts of this forest. The soils are very, very deep. How can it else be? The soil is well conserved due to, due to the forest, so the upper parts are not gone. And you can have different kind of soils on top of each other. This person is climbing on its, uh, his own steps. Here is an old soil with a slightly redder color and another yellowish color on top of it. In most cases, the soils are very old, kaolin uh, kind of mineralogy, and uh, uh, therefore have a very, very extremely low cation exchange capacity. That's in fact our measuring device for measuring the weathering of the soil. So the cation exchange capacity of the clay is very low, below 16, and weatherable minerals are all gone. So uh, therefore, the mineralogic nutrition of this soil is in the trees, and in the roots, and in the organic matter. If you slice that, if you burn that, it goes, and then you end up with a tropical desert with a tropical humid desert because the soil is losing all its power and that's literally what we call desertification. So uh, we have to be very careful for that. If we cut those trees, that we plant it with a crop which is kind of simulating what a, a, a forest does. And one of the solutions could be, for instance, to have oil palm. This is an oil palm, this is also a tree and grass or a legume underneath, and then please don't cut all the forests. Don't cut all the forests. Have bands of forest uh, galleries which are preserving biodiversity, which are kind of buffering the landscape, and then in that way perhaps you can do also some strips with uh, agricultural land next to them, the cash crop. What could that be? It could be maize, cassava of course, and soya beans, for instance, and rotate them. Always keep the soil as much covered as possible and be very careful with mineral fertilizer because mineral fertilizer is going through the soil like a sieve. It will not be maintained. So therefore, organic matter is the buzzword. How can you maintain the organic matter in a soil which has permanent uh, temperature of more than 30 degrees and always humid uh, biological degradation or biological Transformation of the organic matter is hyper fast, so therefore continuous supply. Keep the soil covered with organics and organic uh, cover, uh, plant cover, mulch will certainly uh, make sure you can have these soils um, managed for a long time. Alley cropping is another thing you could do in these soils, although it is a lot of work. We did some experiments on these soils with. Uh, under IITA, International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, Agrifor agroforest systems or conservation agriculture systems can be maintained on such uh, soils, can maintain a medium level yield, if we uh, speak of that in maize, for instance, it would mean uh, something like one ton, two tons, three tons maize per hectare. That's a lot for these soils, but they do have a basic limitation of being a strongly weathered soil. So in that way, it's very difficult to really go for much higher yields as what we are used in Europe, 8 tons, 10 tons. That will be very difficult to, to achieve that. Let's now look at the West African basement complex. And for that, we are going to make a north-south transect which goes all the way from the Sahara, all the way in the southern reaches here, from almost no weathering in the Sahara conditions, 
and then the weathering increases. Eh? And we always look at the cationic stage capacity of the soils, of the clay, to see and we'll look at the vegetation and how the landscape looks like. So we start in the north. And here you can see what is happening. Perhaps, Stefan, we should make the room a bit more dark. I don't know if that's possible, because the slides are yeah, not very... This is what people call a haboob. Haboob is a desert storm. You can see that person standing there. If you dare, please run for your life. Maybe it's not necessary to uh, make it completely dark, but it's a pity for the slides otherwise. Eh? Is that OK? Yeah, that's better. Eh? So uh, that is, in fact, kicking up the desert storms coming from the north, the high pressure in the north, kicking up the dust. Not only sand, eh? there is also a lot of silt and clay, which is in fact brought into the sky. And that is going to be deposited somewhere else. We in Europe think we own the Lus. Eh? We have a lot of Lus. But China is in fact having a lot of Lus with the 200 meters thick. But I, as a student, l was learning that in Africa there is no loss. Excuse me, eh? there is plenty of loss. If you see these things, that means that Africa, the northern part of West Africa, is fertilized by this. This is, an, uh, this is uh, free of charge fertilizer eh? for a huge area of the Sahel. Eh? So that means that all this lime-rich material will be deposited a little bit further south. And it goes very far south. Eh? I was once in a meeting in Ibadan in Nigeria where I had to keep my handkerchief in front of my mouth because I couldn't breathe because of all the dust, fine dust flying around. Eh? So that's forgotten. I mean, this is thanks God because that area of the world is in fact highly populated and having very big crops thanks to this natural fertilizer. This is, in fact, a picture of what is being transported. So you can see here, this in terms of sands, whatever sands is flying is given by the stripes here or by the little dots here. This is, in fact, the sands of the north related to the Sahara. The red are the sands which are not fixed, which can start moving every day again. And these ones, they are fixed in very old dunes, maybe already stabilized by vegetation. And here you have the Kalahari sands, which, as I said, start here in the Kalahari desert and which have been going all the way to the northern part of Congo. Can you imagine? So if you want to map the soil of Congo, you better know this because you are going to find these sands on the terraces of the Congo River and wherever you find it. And please do realize that you may find potholes there because that's things which can develop in a moist climate. Okay, now what kind of soils you expect in the red sands here? Any ideas? Have you discussed already some names in World Reference Base? What is the Latin name of sand? Arena. So, which soil? Arenosols. Yeah. And which type of arenosol? New ones, freshly deposited. Protic was one of the things. I, does it still exist now? Protic arenosol? Maybe you can say haplic to keep it simple. Huh? But there are the red ones, which are actually like from the red haboob. I'm sure that red sand is coated with iron oxides. And in Senegal, I've seen these reddish, beautiful reddish dunes also in Namibia. We call them rubic arenosols. So there, the, there are some adjectives to describe the color. If, I, if you were a plant or a living organism, which one would you prefer? A haplic arenosol or a rubic arenosol? I am trying to find, to find some bridges for land use and sustainability issues. Eh? In Namibia, the people told me they prefer the red ones because they have a, a slightly more active chemical reaction and they can also uh, maintain the moisture a little bit better than just the white arenosols. Why? Because they are less hydrophobic. Sand as such can dispill the water, eh? but these red ones, they absorb the water and that, that can lead to small little 
kind of lichens which may grow or even larger plants to grow. So the color of the sands certainly may make a difference here. So some pictures to show you the shifting sands. This is a picture I took in Morocco. And typically here you can see a lowland. They call it a more a pan or related to a river. You may find solemn checks, salty soils of course and such. And here you have the protic arenal soils. Eh? In the river valleys, in that uh, part of the world, you will find date palms. A high value crop with a limited area. But if you manage them well, they really can bring an income. So these are the oases of the Vallée du Gdudra in, in uh, Morocco. But in Algeria, you have plenty of them as well. El Wet, for instance, in the western part of, uh, in the eastern part of Algeria. If we go further south, things are stabilized, as I showed on the map. And you find the same sands, but they have a much more consolidated kind of feature. They are consolidated by the roots. There is even a little bit of clay, clay migration in the soil, so you can have a, a little half a millimeter thick uh, clay, clay band, but that's not sufficient to call it an argic horizon, of course, because that's not thick enough, it does not function like that. But it helps, of course, to maintain the moisture in this soil. And as a consequence of plant growth, a little bit of organic matter remains behind. The iron coating is uh, there, so you get a brownish color, and they call that the brunic arenosol, brown sandy soil. And that is much, much, much better than the white sands, which are shifting, of course. Because due to the presence of this organic matter and this iron oxides on the sand particles will certainly uh, lead to a slightly better moisture absorption. Rainfall is very limited in those, those areas, 150 to 250 millimeters of rainfall. This is in the northern part of, that's nothing, eh? with a climate which has unbelievable evapotranspiration. But it allows for you to grow groundnuts. And the natural vegetation is partly preserved. This is the typical Acacia senegalensis. Ever heard of that magic tree? It sheds its leaves at the beginning of the rainy season. And it starts flowering and growing back again into greenness after the rainy season. So that's an ideal plant, I would say, as an alley cropping. Because uh, after shedding the leaves, of course, you can see the, the, the groundnuts are better in better shape there, they get a bit of shade from, but not too much shade, and they benefit, of course, from the nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, which is decaying from all these leaves. So this system is very important in terms of maintenance of plant nutrition, in a natural way, of course. These groundnuts, they fix also nitrogen, 60 kilograms per hectare, that is again an interesting one. Now, there is one more thing which is very important to realize is that these trees they are windbreaks, so they reduce slightly the evapotranspiration. So therefore, this system, I think, is the best you can have. The worst thing you can do, actually, is to cut those trees, because then the wind will be higher, and at the, you are at the margin of what is possible, eh? 200 millimeters of rainfall per year. If you then increase your evapotranspiration, that's the end of it. So. Uh, these trees are very important for maintaining, in fact, a precarious system of uh, the West African Sahel. Now I'm going a little bit further south. I'm already in uh, Nigeria here, the Benue area, the northern part, no, the middle part of Nigeria. You can already see the palm trees. It's getting much more moist. We are uh, actually in old deposits of the... Um, and a kind of a transgression of the Gulf of Guinea. That is also in Africa. We had regressions and transgressions of seas in various parts. And here in this part of the, the world, they speak of the Terre de Bar, which is an old, not, not so old. I mean, we are not really in the Kraton area. It's a rejuvenated area by transgression of the, of the um, Gulf of Guinea. Soils we find here are soils with a clay jump 
in the subsoil. That means an Arctic horizon, 40% eh? increase in clay if you compare the topsoil to the subsoil. Now we are in a tropical area. Although the soil is uh, um, maybe less old than to 2 million years, this one is only 1 million, 2 million years old, but still the clay under the beat of a tropical climatic system with sufficient moisture, uh, the clay exchange rate, the cation exchange capacity is very low in this case. It's still low. Um, it is less than 24 centimoles per kilogram of soil. So therefore, this soil, they will come into lixy soils. The base saturation is high. Why is it high? Because these soils have benefited from all this dust, calcareous dust, which has come from uh, the desert over the thousands of years. So uh, that's why, agriculturally speaking, this soil is reasonably fertile. So this part of the soil, the first 80 centimeters, in fact, excellent, but there is a, a layer below there, a horizon, which we call the ferric horizon. It's looking like this. It's slightly compact manganese, iron concretions, and uh, very difficult for the roots to go through. It's a very typical horizon in that part of the world, and uh, it's, in fact, a growth-limiting kind of uh, horizon. If that occurs, certainly make sure that this soil is not eroding. A soil, if you read the books, is highly vulnerable to soil erosion. It will immediately uh, slake. It has very little kind of coagulation. As soon as rain falls, it can just go like that. So again, here, soil cover with mulch or with vegetation is an absolute must uh, in this environment. If I now go further south in the area, here we are in Benin, we find, again, soils with an argic horizon, and the color of the soil is much less reddish than the one we had before. Did you note that? I'm going to take the picture before. Look at the reddish colors. Why? This difference in color, that is very, very typical when you go more moist in a tropical environment. Here we are already with a length of growing period of something like uh, nine months per year. So uh, the iron form will change. So you go from a hematite in the north, in the drier parts, more crystalline iron, to goethite. Goethite is a hydrated form of iron. So the color of the, to the soil tells you a little bit about the overall climatic system in which you are. And also, again, in the possibilities. There are more trees in the environment here. There are cashew nuts there. Um, there are, um, you can easily grow rice in the valley bottom. So you really come into a different ball game from agricultural point of view. And then further, even further south, we are coming uh, in an area with so much rainfall that we come in a comparable situation of uh, what we found in Congo. Uh, I agree that the soil color is a little bit, a bit more reddish here, but the soil is very, very deep, very strongly weathered. And mineralogically speaking, it's almost pure kaolin. And there again, um, we can either be in the realm of feral soils or uh, nitty soils. Now, there is one kind of soil sequence in West Africa which deserves our special attention. I was talking to you about the ferric horizon. Eh? Ferric horizon is almost always there, but there are also horizons which have even a bit more iron than that one, than the ferric horizon. So let's look at that kind of landscape. And those soils, they typically occur here in this part of West Africa in the upper reaches of the Volta, for instance, in Benin, in Nigeria, in the typical savanna areas, you will find these soils. So I'm zooming in here now on Benin. You can see the drainage pattern, and you can see that highland here. Highland, something like 250 meters above sea level. Eh? It's an incised 
kind of dendritic pattern of uh, rivers, uh, cross-cutting through a kind of tableland. So it's really like a West African plateau, which has been slightly uplifted by the Pan-African uh, uplift. And um, yeah, when an area is uplifted, you get, of course, erosion, regressive erosion, all the rivers. So this was the Pedi Plain. It was uplifted, and all the rivers start cutting in again. And then you get all these soils, which were originally in a lowland. They come into the highland. And then something very, very interesting is uh, happening. Here you can see how the land looks like in reality. This is the Niger uh, in uh, Niami, view from the hotel. And you can see these different steps in the landscape. If you go and investigate these steps, you will discover iron ore. Iron ore or the soil name for that, plintite. Ever heard of plintite? It's a mixture of uh, clay, uh, high concentrations of iron and quartz, and that's all. For the rest, no organic matter or nothing. So it's a kind of a soil which is enriched in iron and which in this case has crystallized and forms kind of a, a stabilized situation. But of course, that's a little bit of a soil which looks like concrete and that's not so useful for plant growth. So this is how the plintite develops. This is a typical situation where you would find acrisols, the soils with an arctic horizon. Yeah. Iron moves with the groundwater table and due to a groundwater table fluctuation, eh, dry season low, the wet season it moves up, iron is precipitating in what we call the, the kind of uh, zone of the groundwater fluctuation. To such an extent that sometimes you have 15, 20% of iron in that special horizon. Once you get then an, Afri an uplift of the landscape, all this iron here starts precipitating and crystallizing. And that's when you get consolidation effect of the plintite. So we have two types of plintite in those landscapes. You have the soft plintite, which is in the low reach of the landscape, here and here. And you have the crystallized plintite, which is in fact at the crust of uh, the plateau itself, with here and there a little bit of a residual hill from a previous. Now, that landscape is very typical eh, for the central part of Benin, Niger Nigeria, Togo, Cameroon, wherever you are, you will find that. Even in Senegal, yeah, I've seen such. So, this is a picture I took in Benin in an what we call orthoplintite. Here you can see this is a paddy field, so it's a rice field. If you dig a pit, you will see all these red colors alternating with white colors. Wherever the soil is white, iron has moved away and it concentrates into those slightly more aerated pores of the soil and uh, the plintite is actually formed and accumulating to large uh, percentages. This soil will stay like that without any problem. You can cultivate, you can harvest rice as long as you keep the soil moist. But if you would come into that area, that field, and say, look, I'm going to improve the drainage of the soil so that my rice may have a higher yield, well, that's not going to work. Or you may wish to plant maize or something. You are going to drain this splintite then this soil will become completely hard and after five, six years, this soil will be worse than useless. So this is a very important mistake you should not make with these soils. In Africa, you have forgiving soils, that's our soils. If you do a mistake, you can always return back to the previous. Now, this is one of the soils which is an unforgiving one. It will not forgive you to make a mistake. If you make a mistake here, you will end up with a slab of concrete. 
a little bit like concrete. Let me specify it that way, okay? This is the Plintite Plateau in the same part of Benin, and the farmers have been growing here um, peanuts. And you can see here is the peanuts on uh, beds and furrows to harvest the water. Here is peanuts on the flat. So this is a management system which certainly is important. I have now introduced rhizobium to these farmers to, to, to coat the seeds with a little bit of rhizobium and all of a sudden they get 300% yield increase due to nitrogen fixation by the roots. Once the rhizobium is in this field, they really make money. So this brings them out of poverty. So a small little action and you can uh, advise and you can improve livelihood of a lot of people. Now this is my ogre on the same you see all these little iron bullets here? So here the plintite is crystallized. And the roots can go in between those bullets in the soil, luckily. Because in this soil you have this one. This is the plintite of yeah, what I was showing to you. It's kind of fractured and the roots can still go in between. The soil is harvesting the water. The worst case scenario of plintite is this here where you have kind of like a concrete slab that is impervious. It's nice to make a road, of course, but for the plants, this is absolutely very bad indeed. How would you manage a landscape like that with this here? It's very, very difficult. Is it irreversible? What do you think? Well, some farmers, they say, we will scratch, scratch all the fine soil together into a heap and then we can plant our yams, <coughs> the root crops, on top of that and the roots will then grow in there. Yes, that is possible. If there is still a little bit of fine materials, you can do that. But again, this is an unbelievable job to do. But that's what a lot of farmers do. And then uh, at least try to make sure no more soil erosion is taking place. So these are the few roots you can then harvest, eh? the yams. Eh? They eat it like potatoes. What you also have to know for these soils is that the chemistry is unbelievably poor, and especially phosphate. And to make my point, I'm comparing here, that is a data matrix from an official laboratory in Belgium where I sent some data, some samples from Benin, this is a sample from the farmer Ralia Tendin of his plintite soil, and this is a farmer of a biological farmer in Belgium in the Leuze Belt, just to give you the comparison. Eh? If you look at the, the phosphate, for instance, here we have 16 um, milligrams of uh, phosphate per uh, milligrams per 100 gram, and here you have uh, only one, so that's only a trace. Uh, so that's really very bad. Organic matter is in percent is very, organic carbon is very low indeed. And then um, here, uh, sodium, potassium is all on the low side. It's only the magnesium, which is a little bit here, which is more or less okay. So that's a thing. Phosphate is very low in actual amount, but also it is very low because there is a lot of phosphate fixation on the whatever clay is in these soils. The phosphate is actually also on this splintite. It's typically fixing the phosphate uh, so that it, it becomes almost not available for the plants. So these soils are really suffering from water problems, water availability, and from the chemistry. So here you can see Mr. Din showing us his compost heap. He has a kind of a goat farm for milking goats. And uh, whatever compost he can harvest from that, he carefully, judiciously applies this to the field. And in that way, he can maintain his uh, field crops. So the kind of uh, livestock farming systems, zero grazing livestock, where you can harvest the, the, the fishes the leftovers from the livestock and then bring them back, compose them properly, 
bring them back into the farmer's field. That is, in fact, a very important aspect, I would say, of integrated management of plinto soils. And there's another thing. If your soil is like this here, the iron slab, this is a profile. Here it is kind of little piezolithic plintite. That means it are the little iron kind of uh, stones which can be rooted. But here you can see you, uh, you really have an iron slab. So the result is that almost no more vegetation here. And whatever vegetation comes is being eaten by the goats. Because livestock, extensive livestock systems are the key word there of the pearl, which are cross, uh, crossing the countryside there from the north to the south, eating whatever they can get. And actually, the livestock is the bank account of the owner. So the more, the merrier. But the more, the merrier is not the good solution for this kind of landscapes. Eh? To, to have, uh, so how would you manage this? Well, I would say keep the livestock off the land. And then you can help the situation, and I've seen a fantastic experiment like that in Niger on cutting a little hole here and then have one of these strong growing acacia albidas, which we saw in Senegal, plant them there and water them for a few years. And then new material will blow in because there are these wind storms, they bring dusts and, and make a little bit the soil irregular there, make a little half moon, the zaya, they call that in, uh, in uh, the zaya technique in, in West Africa. A little fine material will accumulate there. Whatever rainfall, please send it with, with that fine material in a little furrow into that little hole you dig here. And then you can really restore a kind of a savanna vegetation. And that will cut the wind, the, the act as a windbreak, and the whole system can reverse. But it's a tedious exercise. Now at the moment, a new project is taking place. They call it the green barrier for the desert, stop the desert. And they are really trying in the West African Sahel, all the way from Saint Louis in northern Senegal, all the way to uh, the northern part of uh, Chad, to have a barrier established like that. One of the things they should do, actually, I am not sure if they do that, is to go for zero grazing goat farming. Niger, they have the technique already as an indigenous system in Benin. Benin. We are now working with that. So the, these are two. Uh, this is a farmer uh, community, Din and Raliat, supported by a Belgian NGO. And rather than having all these goats going their way all over the place, eating the last piece of tree, we keep them inside. Here you can see the male, very strong one, and the females in very simple stables. Eh? You don't need high tech for that. And then here you can see Raliat milking her goat. She is harvesting three liters of milk on average per day from every goat. That is a huge quantity. You know, on average, an average cow in that area is harvesting what? One, one liter? So this is three times what an average farmer is harvesting. Do you know how many children we can get out of malnutrition with these three liters of milk? Six. Six children out of malnutrition by one goat. How much food does that cost for us? Do you have any idea? Of course, you have to produce food. You need feed and water, of course. So the feed, you have that area you can have three crops, leguminous trees. Uh, there are quite a number of trees you can serve for the, uh, help for that. There is Sesbania sesban, there is uh, Leucena leucocephalens, and there are a lot of other Clericidia, all kinds of little trees you can grow. And then that fodder is collected also, maybe some uh, napier grass or elephant grass in gullies to control soil erosion. All that bring together in simple stables. Here you can see an experiment, one of our experiments in IITA, where we grow together cowpeas together we here with Gliricidia trees. So every year, two times per year, you can cut all these branches and feed it, or have taller trees and cut the branches. For 12 kilograms of this food, feed, 12 kilograms of this feed, you can uh, 
uh, feed those goats and they will produce six liters of milk. That is fantastic. Big problem, of course, is to bridge the dry season because the dry season is very long, six, seven, eight months. But we have now the technique to do like what we do in Belgium as well, and I'm sure in many of your countries as well, silage. You know silage? You just make a, a pit, make it anaerobic with a piece of plastic, have the fresh material in there, seal it off, and you can have that food well preserved for a long dry season. So then the other thing you need is, of course, water. Water in this area, I've done a lot of water exploration there myself, and the subsoil there is granitic. So you have plintite on top of granite. In the granites, it's full of cavities, full of, that's something people didn't know actually. And once you understand where to have your wells, you can easily uh, make sure that you can have water for even uh, uh, serving your fodder plantations and for watering your animals, of course. So change is possible, even in those marginal areas. That's my experience. The only thing you have to make sure is harvest water. Don't allow the water to run down, just like that, the landscape, because of soil erosion. That's one thing. You, the soils are very vulnerable, we know that. So therefore, beds and furrows, conservation agriculture, organic matter management, water harvesting, and then you can have your cycle running like this. We have now demo farms, farms like that all over the place in the central part of Benin, in Nigeria. And um, so far so good, we are working and uh, I'm very optimistic that things may change for the better there. So this, ladies and gentlemen, are solutions which are better than allowing people to drown in the Mediterranean. Eh? I mean, these are the type of people who run away because of their home is no more sustaining their families. We have to provide a future for these people there with smart solutions. And the smart solutions are not necessarily expensive solutions. We just learn technologies from somewhere in the world, apply it, test it out with the farmers, and then come to solutions like here. So I strongly believe in that. West Africa has other important peculiarities. Uh, you told us West Africa was all the same. Eh? We have already seen that north-south transect, but there is, and then we had already the side tracking of the plintosols, and now I am coming with a third big factor of variation. The area I'm going to take you to is this place. The Chad Basin, the Niger Depression, and the Rio de Oro is a big depression here for the coast of uh, Senegal. Although they all look more or less the same at first glance on the map, there are unbelievable differences in history of the soil, in the setup of the soils, and in the sustainability issues we are facing now for managing these soils. Let's start with Lake Chad. For understanding the Chad Basin, we have to know that Lake Chad is a lowland which does not connect to the oceans. For soil perspective, this is of course a very important thing to realize. That means that all the salts, wherever they are produced, whatever water is running in that air area, is all culminating and arriving in the lake here. And uh, 8,000 years ago, during a, a more moist period of that part of the world, Lake Chad was far, far larger than what it is now. At that time, it was 4, 400,000 square kilometers, so it was huge. Now, it's only 17,000 square kilometers. So it is a little bit more than half of the size of Belgium, which is nothing at all on the map of the world. So why uh, has it dried out? Well, it has a lot to do with the overall climate, climate change after uh, late glacial times, boreal times, but um, it also has related to water takeoff of the uh, irrigation systems here in the Logon and the Chari River and the Baral Gazal areas. People are taking water for irrigating and there is less water remaining to run into the lake. It's a little bit like the Aral Sea. Eh? 
Uh, that's a known story, of course, of a lake which is drying out. So the same is actually happening in Lake Chad. If we look at the soil map, we see that uh, the soils are dominated by vertisols. Vertisols that are soils of swell shrink clays, and they typically develop in old lake deposits, old lake clays. But there is a lot of the pinkish color here that are solon chucks, solon chucks, and that is directly related with the lake which is concentrating all the nutrients. You get accumulation of salts, and therefore um, these solon chucks are part of a sustainability issue, I would say. So potentially speaking, all these old lake deposits are rich. Vertisols are of course good soils, but they become a little bit less suitable if there is more salts accumulated in them. And now, of course, the water issue is there. There is less water available. So I think for the long-term future, that area does not look too brilliant. I would say there is going to be a problem. Let me take now to this part. It's about 600 thousand hectares of uh, beautiful glay soils on the map. Glay soils, why not soils with salts there? Well, we are here in an area, it's called the internal delta of the Niger River. So the Niger River has deposited there in um, Lake Aruane. Wait, no, I don't have that slide here. It used to be a very big lake, that whole area, and uh, Lake Aruane in glacial times was cut out by a small little river, a tributary of the Niger, Sokote, and it just um, tapped off that lake. Now it is a huge area, 600,000 hectares, uh, beautiful land, as you can see from here, uh, rice land, but farmers are suffering because the yield levels are not up to normal. Normally speaking, in such an environment, we would expect up to six, eight tons of rice per season, but they are touching rarely two tons per hectare. Why could that be? Well, there's a lot to do with the water management itself. So usually the water is not sufficiently uh, managed. Some fields are too dry where they need water, so it's the overall master plan of the area, which is not so efficient. The other thing is a chemical time bomb, which is uh, ticking. I read some studies, I'll show you one graph here of a, a pilot study which was done by a soil scientist from uh, France, Mr. Bertrand, Professor Bertrand, and uh, he uh, made a, a grid study of the soil pH and exchangeable sodium of uh, a target area. And here you can see the pH values uh, between 50 and 100 centimeters. And here the sodium content at the same uh, depth. And the red colors and the purple colors here in this graph give you alkalinity. That means the pH is far too high more than eight, uh, okay, rice can still stand a little bit of that, but it, it really has too much exchangeable sodium here. And then there is a lot of other troubles, structure decay, which is starting to show in the soil, less rootability of the soils. So Bertrand was warning us, this, this slide is now already six, seven years old. He was saying, look, unless you do something about this, what you can do uh, on that is uh, to apply gypsum, for instance, to counteract the effect of uh, the rising pH. But again, that's an investment which you have, you have to offset with extra income from the rise. So there is problem there. So you can see, rather than having excess salts, what we had in the Chad Basin, here you have a problem of a pH or the general nutrient balance of the cations which is uh, really compromised. And the uh, people who have designed the irrigation system should have foreseen that. You can calculate such things. You can model that. You can even calculate how fast, after how many years, 
this land will be worse than useless. And to, you can counter that chemically by soil amendments, but it's not so easy. And it's usually more costly to return the damage to reshape the soil rather than to prevent it and have a little addition to the irrigation water. Okay? The last uh, depression I'm going to uh, show here is uh, the Rio de Oro, that is the whole part of the Western African soilscape here, from Guinea-Bissau to uh, the northern part of Senegal. And I'll take as a case study here Saint Louis, uh, Senegal, where um, you have a huge old delta of the Senegal River, which due to the pan-African uplift has just gotten a little bit above sea level, some meters, eh? 10, 15 meters above sea level. As a result, of course, a huge swamp has drained, but that swamp was originally salty, of course, due to the, the, the sea which was there. And secondly, the whole area used to be full of mangroves. And you know what is associated with mangroves? Does anybody of you know any kind of soil issue which relates to a mangrove history? You don't know? Let me discuss that with you then, very briefly. Here you can see some of the rem re remaining mangroves. And on the roots of these mangroves, there are bacteria which are, in fact, harvesting the sulfur from the water which comes in with the side of the sea. Every two times per day the water comes and goes back. And every time a little bit of sulfur is accumulated and uh, ex um, exudated as uh, pyrite, polypyrite, iron sulfide, which is a neutral salt. Eh? There is nothing wrong with that, as long as it remains underwater. Once, once this whole area comes above the water, all of a sudden all these sulfides get oxidized in presence of water. What is going to happen? Do you know that? Formation of which? Yes, of course. And the soil becomes so acidic, if you dare to touch with your finger, your finger will burn. And the roots, everything will die. Eh? So that's the story of the acid sulfate soils, together with the salts there. So that's two times a problem. Eh? So here you can see the uh, soil in its original condition, with large quantities of these uh, sulfides. The soil mm -hmm. is smelly as well. As soon as you start draining this, you get the um, kind of uh, yellowish colors which uh, they call jarosite, and once that starts, the, the Dutch had this problem as well, eh, in the Eiselmeer polders here, and they call that cat clay, because it's, it looks a little bit like the fishes of the cats, and it has a worse taste, and it has a terrible soil reaction, it has a, a terrible uh, kind of uh, pH dropping uh, consequence, and of course, all the vegetation is irreversibly dead. Eh? I would say this soil is unforgiving as well, almost as much as the uh, plintosols, which turn into a stone. Here the soil is still soft. And can you just say, ah, I did a mistake. I'm going to put the water back on. Is that going to help you? Well, it will not help very much, because then you will form um, H2S, which is a poisonous gas eh, in anaerobic condition, and then everything will die again. So uh, the only thing you can do is to lime, huge quantities of lime. Lime, of course, can redress the pH of the soil. But I've seen calculations of the quantity of lime you need for rehabilitating these soils, and it is just mind-boggling. 250 tons of lime per 10 centimeter of soil uh, to bring it back into level are figures I've read somewhere. So in areas we, which don't have too much lime, there are some shells, seashells lying about there, which can be used. Yes, that is possible. So that are issues, ladies and gentlemen, 
which have to be addressed. But it's possible in certain parts of the Senegal Delta, I have seen areas which, due to huge quantities of lime-rich water, have been rehabilitated. And some of the shells which were in the environment have contributed also to the rehabilitation. So not everything is lost. And at the moment there is something like 30,000 hectares of good land now, after the soil is restored, which is producing two times eight tons of rice per hectare, but with huge quantities of water to be irrigated. They apply huge quantities. I mean, it is about uh, 2,000 millimeters of water. Can you imagine? Two meters of water they irrigate. Why so much water? Because there is a huge salinity here in these soils. I have measured electrical conductivity in the drainage ditches. This is an irrigation ditch. This is the drainage ditch. I measured in the drainage ditch, ditch electrical conductivities of 28 dC Siemens per meter, which is almost like the seawater. So it is uh, fossil water which is sitting in the subsoil there, which is uh, climbing every time into the... Uh, sorry for that. No, let me do that away. Yeah, it's all that. So uh, it is uh, a very difficult thing altogether. So here you can see experiments under the West African Rice Development Institute for um, finding rice varieties which um, may be more resistant against, wa against the salinity and um, that seems to work uh, reasonably fine. So let's break now. This is a logical place for breaking. <laughs>